we can support a whole movement in development, giving up this idea that we know how to do it and kind of mm. working together to figuring it out on the way and actually not wait for failure, but secure success. Welcome to Vox Dev Talks. My name is Tim Phillips. Well, today we have another in our Vox Dev Talks on how to put research into practice. This summer, we're talking to the experts who make that happen and how they approach the challenge. Well, the challenge of creating evidence-based policy inspired Ariana Legovini of the World Bank to create an entirely new model of impact evaluation that's vastly expanded our knowledge of which interventions work, how they work, and how best to implement them. She's the director of DIME at the World Bank and she joins me now to explain what it is and how it puts research into practice. So Ariana, welcome to Fox Dev Talks. Thank you, Tim. Ariana, first of all, what does DIME stand for? DIME stands for Development Impact Evaluation, the idea that we can use rigorous science to inform the process of development. And it's purpose is what? What was the problem before we had DIME? When I came out of my PhD and joined the World Bank, this was a time in which the World Bank and others were trying to move away from kind of top-down development. But in fact, most of the development was top-down. A lot of expert opinion mm -hmm. informed the interventions and the policies that would then get implemented in countries. And I found that extremely uncomfortable. And I was thinking, okay, how do we change that balance of power? How do we get people on the ground to develop their own solutions to their own problems? And uh, I came out of my first few months of employment with the idea of reading a whole new literature and kind of starting to understand how we can use rigorous evidence to inform the process in real time and really give a lot of inputs to people and help them develop their own knowledge about what works in their context. In this top-down development paradigm that used to exist, we don't hear so much about it anymore. What was the problem in the outcomes? Were we just doing things that didn't work? Yeah, this idea that people know what is right, that they yeah. can go by theory and figure out what should be implemented was a very strong underlying concept. As a result, we developed rigid designs for projects and policies, mm -hmm. and then really provided very little or no support to the implementation process. I call this a jump in the dark. You know, you have your theory and you implement it no matter what. And the idea here is to transform that from a process, kind of a, a blind walking into mm -hmm. a GPS mode, you know, where you know where you're going, but you can use technology to help you move around in the most efficient way. And that technology can be quite helpful in kind of shedding light into your path and figure out how you change the process of development in the direction of greater efficiency and greater impact. Changing the way that large institutions do things is never particularly easy, is it? So you're there in the World <laughs> Bank. To, to, you know, tell me when, when this is. You're relatively new compared to some of the people that are responsible for some of this policy. You're trying to convince them to do things a different way. What was the reaction at the World Bank? Well, at that time, impact evaluation was very rare. Mm. Even within projects, if they were evaluated, they were evaluated at the end, if at all. And so with the idea that maybe we could learn something exposed that would be useful for the future. So there was a lot of skepticism. And um, my first boss even told me not to waste any time on impact evaluation. <laughs> <laughs> so what I did basically was to start developing partnerships with people in managerial position that had the power to work with me and of merging different specialties, the research together with the operational side and thinking about, okay, can we do something together that makes sense in terms of improving what people know and how they progress? At that time, there was not the wealth of data and information that there is today. It mm. was much more costly and slower process of collecting a lot of survey data. Today, you know, we have a huge amount of data that comes from technology and digital and mobile that we can leverage and do this much more easily. But at that time, we developed programs and had to figure out a lot of financing for these activities that was not available. And mm -hmm. uh, it was, you know, it was an upward battle. Now, as a surprising little 
part here, all the people who worked with me in the beginning to put their portfolios under purview of mm -hmm. this idea and kind of start trying out things with us were all women. Interesting. And when was this? Yeah, this was 2004, 2005, when we got mm -hmm. started. And we started out with a few programs in education, HIV, malaria, agriculture, and private sector. To make this work as well, you I guess you also had to convince researchers outside the bank. You would also have had to have conversations with policymakers to make sure that this was the sort of information that they would use. Were they easy to convince? Well, so I actually policymakers were my biggest ally uh -huh. in this process. And why? Because no one wants to be told what to do. People you know, this idea that we could work with them to provide them the capabilities to figure out their own solutions to their own problems was something really exciting. If I can give an example, in our malaria program, we started testing this kind of vertical policy on providing malaria kits to health workers in the communities. And through our program, countries discovered that this was not a very good approach. In fact, that more than half of the children that came to these health workers had fever, but not because of malaria. And these workers had nothing in their toolkits to treat mm -hmm. non-malaria related fever. And so the countries, including Zambia and Senegal and other countries, part of our programs, went back to the Global Fund and negotiated a fever management program instead of a malaria management program. Just this idea that they could leverage their own local evidence to then negotiate at the global level for a change in policy is really exciting to countries. And so policymakers really were a huge ally in pushing the bank to adopt a new way of doing things. In terms of researchers, this is a movement, and I cannot claim to be the only member of this movement. It's a huge <laughs> movement that yeah. has transformed development economics from a theoretical science into an empirical science. This is super exciting. Together with academics and different institutions, we really have changed the whole ecosystem with so many students today undertaking experimental work mm. all over the world. This profession and this way of doing things has grown tremendously in the last 20, 20 to 25 years. I was talking to Esther Duflo only a couple of weeks ago about 20 years of J-PAL and how what seemed extraordinary at that time and very different is now very much the way in which development economics is done. When I'm talking to people in the commercial world about when they try to change the culture of how their organisations work, they always have this phrase, they talk about having some quick wins to get momentum, things that grab people's attention, those successes. Did you manage to have those at the beginning to convince people that you were onto a good thing? Definitely. The whole idea of the work that we do is to focus on those important questions that would have an inordinate mm. effect on our bottom line. And what is our bottom line? Saving and improving lives, reducing poverty and contributing to the whole development process. In that program that I mentioned in malaria, we yeah. had the first big national trial in Zambia testing different ways of distributing medicines so that they would actually reach the hospitals and clinics. When we conducted our first data collection, we found that they had huge stockouts of medicines. And so when patients went to these clinics, they would not receive the treatment needed. During that first trial of testing different ways of distributing drugs to the clinics, we saved 4,000 children. Wow. Only during the trial. Not during the scale up yeah. that then allowed the whole system to deliver better health to the whole country, but only during the trial. Can you imagine the excitement? I always say mm -hmm. those 4,000 children have paid for everything that we have done since, even if we had not contributed anything more other than those 4,000 children. So Ariana, you're going to have to educate me on how DIME works today. Uh, so first of all, what sort of evaluation, what sort of projects does DIME get involved with? One of the purpose of doing this type of work is actually to show how we can change the whole development process, no matter mm -hmm. the sector, no matter the type of projects that we work with. Mm -hmm. In my experience, there's never been one project where we could not pay for our keep, 
So we have basically broken into all sectors and especially all under-evaluated sectors, even those sectors where no one thought experimentation would be applicable. Mm -hmm. Just to give you an example, the big infrastructure sector captures about a half of development finance, but back in like 2012, it only represented about two to three percent of all impact evaluations. <laughs> so obviously, this is a huge amount of resources that are not being looked through the magnifying lens. Mm -hmm. And of course, we we are not going to randomly assign the placement of a big highway or a metro system and so on. But there are so many questions related to transport infrastructure that are completely amenable to research and rigorous investigation. Very small details, things that people don't spend much time thinking about, turn out to be very critical in transforming the impact of this infrastructure. And I'm talking about infrastructure that only takes us halfway towards impact. And all these other things, pricing, incentives, ways of inducing participation, modal shift, and so forth and so on, represent the other half of our impact. And so by not looking at infrastructure in a very rigorous fashion, we're actually leaving money on the table. One of the big issues here are operations and maintenance, mm -hmm. usage and sustainability. These are issues that are very much under-researched. We have many, many examples of how we look at these sectors. And we're not just doing randomized controlled trials. We actually take a complete integrated approach to evaluating these type of interventions. We start with developing the data ecosystems by integrating and merging high frequency data from many sources, from administrative data to mobile, digital, remote sensing data to understand spatially the environments that we're working with. We can use these data systems to actually understand where the problems are and where we should invest more of our efforts to get a greater bang for our buck. And then using these systems to experiment with different pricing, different incentives, different ways of doing things and get real time feedback into these systems to optimize their way forward. I guess to do this effectively, you have to be involved very early in the process. How do you make sure that that happens? I always say to everyone, we want to start at the very beginning. Really, when the thinking starts, we want to be mm -hmm. there and even before some time. So examples of these data infrastructure, we may develop data for a city like the city of Nairobi for a specific purpose, but then we can readapt it for new purposes. So we develop mm -hmm. a system for Nairobi to look at road safety. And today we're using the system to inform the construction of bus rapid transit and the transformation in urban mobility in the city. So yes, from the very beginning, but actually investments in data, if they're already available and we have already been done, gives us a big boost forward. And, and do your researchers get involved day to day? Are they on the ground collecting that data and analyzing it and feeding back? Or are they at sort of one remove where they look at what's happened, but they're not there all the time? So the whole approach is very much geared towards the building capacities in local agencies mm -hmm. to do this on the ground. Yeah. So every piece of work is really designed to leave something behind of significance for these institutions. So we are very, very much involved in the day-to-day -day and we put full-time capacity in these institutions throughout the work. This may take three, four, five, six, sometimes seven years of collaborations mm -hmm. to build the local capacities for doing this. And what are those local capacities? It is training for government officials, and even local researchers. It is building systems. It is building dashboards and abilities to use their own data more effectively to inform the day-to-day -day working. And it is also mm -hmm. kind of co-producing and co-managing all these trials on the ground for them to learn how to do this and introduce changes in policies in a way that is then amenable to getting very precise estimates of what works and how. The whole idea is really testing different ways of doing things to learn how to adopt the things that work best and move the development process forward in the right direction. 
How have you found is the most effective way to communicate what you're learning here and make sure that the people can do something about it are hearing the message that you're giving to them about what works? So we never wait for papers. <laughs> we, we have this you know, strong partnerships, both at the sector level, at the country level, and at the project level. And the project people learn in real time because they're actually doing the analysis with us. And they're the first with whom we discuss what are the implications of the finding and what should be decided moving forward. So we are really, really good at this. You know, the, mm -hmm. using the local knowledge to inform local decisions right away. I can pat our own shoulders and say, we're doing this really well. The challenges start when we take these findings and start informing others. So we generally work programmatically with many countries at the same time in different thematic areas. And so we use workshops and in-depth discussions to discuss with other countries the implications of each country's findings, not to just tell them to adopt, but to mm -hmm. stimulate their thinking about what might work in their own context. And if they think it is an appealing idea, then we help them implementing the testing in their own context as well. I am not a big believer in just giving people results and say, go ahead and do it. But I am a big believer in supporting these processes of adoption in, a, in an intelligent way. Yes, we spend a lot of time on Vox Talks talking about external validity of the research that's being done. And a lot of people are naturally very, very cautious about that. And what you're saying here is that it's not just the results, the outcomes, but developing methodologies that can be applied to make whatever's happening more useful wherever you are. We are always working to the extent possible with causal methods. Mm -hmm. But we always start with questions rather than answers or rather than methods, yeah. facilitating a process of asking important questions. This is not necessarily easy. So we bring a lot of people around the table to think together what are the most important questions, the answers for which may really contribute to the development process. You know, there is a difference between important questions and interesting questions. Some questions are interesting, like for publication purpose. I always tell my clients, let's ask the important questions. But when we have researchers who may have different incentives and will ask for some quirky thing, allow them to do the quirky thing because we're bringing in the top of the profession. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there should be good incentives for everybody to work on the public good, even, you know, having small little private good <laughs> components to it. The idea here is definitely to ask the very important questions, provide opportunities for research to contribute, and sometimes, as you say, using different ways and different methods to contribute to those questions. So if I can give an example, we worked in Ghana with a sustainable land management project. And right away, the project was not delivering on its targets for replanting tree and reforestation, so they came and asked us for help. We then ran a multi-arm trial to introduce incentives for farmers to plant trees and cater to them for survival. And what we found is that by introducing monetary incentives, i.e. paying farmers to plant trees and take care of them, it's a job, we actually could increase three times. That's great. But then we figured that those incentives were kind of from out of a hat and they were not really optimized. So in the next stage, we used some other methods, in this case, a uniform auction to extract information from farmers about their reservation wages, the wage at which they would be willing to plant trees. And what we found is that a large decrease in the incentives provided would actually lower participation by a very small amount, but at the same time, freeing up a lot of the budget. And so we were able in the second phase of the project to double the geographical coverage of that project, basically turning $30 million of a project essentially in $60 million. And we spent only half a million to do this whole work, meaning half a million turned 30 million into 60 million. And this is a general lesson, which is that a very small investment in science can transform the way our projects deliver by increasing their impact by 50%, 100%, sometimes 300%. When you get big results, 
30 million into 60 million. It must get the attention of the people around you. Are there any particular projects that you remember that really got everyone to sit up and take notice of what you're doing? One of my projects that I really like is this project on road safety in Nairobi that I mentioned earlier, Mm -hmm. where we spent a lot of time establishing a real-time urban management system for the city of Nairobi. The main result from the first stage of this work is that just 1% of the road network, 40 kilometers, represent half of the deaths in the city. And so when poor countries or middle-income countries or even rich countries need to target their investments to where it mattered most to save people's lives, they need to have the information necessary to do so. Can you imagine trying to resolve road safety problems across the whole city. And all of a sudden, you have a prioritized Mm. list of 200 locations where your investments will be able to reach the SDG on half immortality on the roads. The whole reason for starting this project was there was no data to start with, no Mm. idea of where to put our efforts into, not only in Nairobi, but all over the world. And after 13 years of the SDG established on road safety, we had seen no change in mortality on the road. And this is not even a a trial, randomized control trial. It is simply investing a lot in information and turning that information into action that makes sense. In the well, the decade and a half that you've been able to run this project, are there things that you do now that you wouldn't have done then or things that you did then that didn't work out well? What have you learned along the way? You know, we have grown a lot. <laughs> we are now <laughs> a group of 300 PhD economists, data scientists, data analysts, program managers, field coordinators, even software engineers. It's been an amazing growth. I started as one person and then we grew tremendously to support this process for an institution like the World Bank, but also many other institutions that we are supporting. And every time I hire someone, Mm. I hire them on their technical knowledge and on their attitude towards making a difference. And every time somebody comes in, I ask them the same thing. I say, look at us and tell me what we are doing wrong and you can do better. And then every person has become the center of one particular innovation that we have introduced in our way of doing things. And this is not just for my group, but even thinking and looking at the World Bank and thinking, okay, how how can we do this better? I think I believe in innovation, but I believe in innovation not because ideas come from the outside, but because you can actually use the process of doing things to figure out how we can do better. So yes, we have learned on the way how to do things better. And of course, technology has helped us a lot in the recent past. Uh, We have transformed the way we do things. From a lot of data collection in the field, pretty slow, then introducing technology to collect data better, to use technology to check on data quality in real time, and so forth and so on. Today, you know, we have expanded our data science and used digital information and mobile information to capitalize on that. Now we are working even on the operational side to bring all the digital and technology into our programming at the bank and so forth and so on. I think that's the only way to function, really, is to keep an open mind, not being defensive about what you do. There is no point in that. Just Mm. keep it open and listen to the young people coming into your groups and listen to their idea and implement those ideas and figure out how you can participate and support them in uh, making sure those ideas reach the people that they need to reach. I just want to mention the example of education where, you know, we have invested in education for many, many years in the systems and education systems are not delivering. And during COVID, a huge learning gap, even bigger than before, but it just highlighted the problems that were already there. And so we are launching a new program in introducing disruptive technologies for education. We have a few trials that we have already undertaken to show the amazing power that technology can have in helping children learn to read, write, do numbers. We want to support a process of empowering those disruptors to demonstrate 
their capabilities and then work with government and implementers to introduce these interventions to complement more traditional investments in education systems, but also in health and other areas. Are there any people or problems or places that you have not been able to reach yet that you want to get to? Oh, that's a big question. The reason why I started this group in the World Bank is because I thought if the World Bank does it, then others will do it as well. Mm -hmm. So today we are in a very critical moment in the world. We are all aware of all the multiple crises and the multiple issues we're trying to deal with, a huge pressure for the World Bank and others to increase financing in uh, development and address those issues. At the same time, a huge push to become better at what we do. I feel this is a critical moment for scaling up what we do and mainstream and as part and parcel of what everyone does and use development finance as a learning tool, not just as a financing tool kind of taking knowledge at a completely different level in terms of our ability to support countries move forward. And so we have started conversations at very high levels with many governments to launch a new initiative that may be launched later this year, which is a global alliance for development impact with the ideas that we can support a whole movement in development change the way they think about development, kind of giving up this idea that we know how to do it and kind of mm. working together to figuring it out on the way and actually not wait for failure, but secure success in the process. Think back a couple of decades, Ariana, and you and people who thought like you were the outsiders. You were the unusual ones. Well, now with the potential for this and with the work that you see being done now, this kind of impact evaluation, this is how development economics increasingly is done. Would the success of DIME eventually mean that perhaps it's just not needed because this is business as usual? Can you see that time? <laughs> You mentioned Esther and, of course, Abhijit and others. We are part of this movement. I would say that this is not about dying. It is really about a different way of doing development. And we are very aligned in the way we think about why science is so fundamental, because we see it with our own eyes, how things can progress and change. Now, that does not mean, however, that specialization in what we do is not needed. I feel very uncomfortable sometimes where people assume that everybody can do the same job. No, research is a very specialized area. My researchers, j network, everybody who's working in this area specializing in not only the methods, but also knowing the evidence and investing a lot of thinking about what is important to research and how to support countries move forward. So I see that we want to mainstream this, but we need to mainstream it by increasing the amount of research capacity around the world. And I was just last week in Rome having these conversations with different research networks in the Africa region, different think tanks, and supporting the launch of another initiative, which is that global to provide a lot of training and capacities to local think tanks to partake and participate more actively in the development process. So this is really the way I think of it, not that time will not be needed, but that we need to make a much bigger effort mm -hmm. to increase the amount of capacity locally and globally to support the process of developing evidence and knowledge as part of the development process. It is not that government officials will be able to do it on their own, but that we can create those partnerships and long-term collaborations to co-create a lot of evidence that then can be channeled to improving the way we reduce poverty, secure greater growth, manage climate change, and so forth and so on. Well, it's an inspiring story, so let's hope that there is a lot more of it. But for now, Ariana Legovini, thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. Much appreciated. If you want to know more about how DIME works, the easiest way to do that is to look it up on the World Bank's website. So go along to worldbank.org slash DIME, D-I-M-E. 
This has been a Vox Dev Talk. The best way to make sure you never miss an episode is to subscribe. You can do that wherever you get your podcasts. And all our past episodes, as well as articles about the papers we feature, are also at voxdev.org.